So once again, for everyone that arrived late, my name is Frank Amert from the European AIDS Treatment Group. I'm going to moderate today's session on research development and advocacy for self-testing options, an e-meeting on the diagnostic landscape for HIV, viral hepatitis and STIs. We have two language channels, English and Russian. Please choose the preferred channel on the bottom line of Zoom. Uh, you refer through the channel the language you will be speaking yourself and you receive uh, the translation if someone is speaking in the other language. Please keep your microphone muted when not speaking yourself and feel free to include any question in a written format in both languages, either in Russian or English in the channel, uh, in the chat function. Having said that, I would like to welcome you uh, this webinar will provide an update on research and development of rapid diagnostic and tests. And of course, we will not only talk about the new technologies, but we will see uh, what uh, we have to deal with uh, when it comes about access. And access is very often about regulation, legislation, pricing, and there are also different stakeholders have to interact. We are going to start the meeting with a very first presentation provided by Emmanuel Fajardo from WHO, and he's giving a first overview on the diagnostic test for self-testing. And I would like to ask Emmanuel for his presentation. Hello, everyone. I hope you are all keeping well in these challenging times. And I'm very glad to be sharing with you some of the latest um, updates about self-testing in general for HIV and viral hepatitis and STIs. So before going into the details of self-testing, I just wanted to make sure we all have the same concept about what self-testing is. So um, self-testing is a process when individuals, they take the, the test and they perform the test, but also they interpret their test results individually, independently of a healthcare worker. Um, self-testing is being uh, used as an additional screening approach to, to, to reach people who usually don't attend health facility level. Uh, this means that this test is considered, we call it a triage test. So it's just a, a test to identify those people. And then further, you need uh, further confirmation with the traditional um, testing algorithms used in each country. So you can go ahead to the first slide. Uh, so before uh, going to the self-testing itself, we, which is an innovative approach to reach those people, uh, you know, most of the people diagnosed with, uh, with HIV, viral hepatitis, and STIs, they usually reach the facility level, which means that they have to go through an algorithm kind of uh, procedure. In this slide, we're showing here the WHO three test strategy. So it means after you get the self test, you still need to be confirmed your status of HIV, for example, with uh, three tests. However, uh, in many countries still, they use very complicated assays uh, that may add to the delay of diagnosing individuals. So for example, in Western Europe and in some countries in Asia and Latin America, they are still using the, I think it's an 85 year old uh, method, which is the Western blot. And in here, in this slide, we're showing just the timing if you use the Western blot as part of the testing algorithm, you can see here that it takes you around two months to be able to have a profile for this participant, for this individual to be diagnosed. So actually Western blot is uh, old fashioned. Uh, we have simpler tests that actually can diagnose people much faster. And that's why the WHO recommendation in 2019 calls for countries to move away from these 
um, longest-standing methodology for diagnosing HIV participants. So we still need uh, communities to advocate for, even for the facility-based uh, testing, to simplify their algorithms. And we have very good uh, rapid diagnostic tests and even enzyme immunoassays that can be used together to be able to diagnose participants. Uh, then we can go ahead with the next slide just to give you a little bit of an overview about the, 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 the HIV self-testing, which is really the, 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 the one that we've been working uh, for a long time. And we have clear guidelines and countries are using now this uh, uh, on a routine basis. So just to give you a reference, a time reference, in 2012, the first self-test became commercially available. This was uh, the American product uh, that was approved in the US, the AuraQuick, which I know many of you are aware of. And into, so it was in 2012 that it became available and many countries started using it online and purchasing. And by 2015, uh, 2015 we, uh, well, the WHO uh, already gave a hint about the potential of this test to reach people outside of health facilities. So, but there was no uh, strong evidence about the impact of self-testing. So the recommendation at that point, there was no official recommendation but uh, WHO highlighted the potential benefits of self-testing. So this was in 2015. Also in this uh, guideline, uh, something that became very important for many countries also to regulate or, or to make it official was that people that were not healthcare workers, they could also conduct testing, you know? So there was this recommendation about lay providers, which means people that don't have a prof health profession that they can also test for HIV and other diseases with the same accuracy that the, the professionals. So this became a very important uh, policy that came in force in 2015 and many countries are already uh, doing this. You can go to the next slide. Then one year later, there was already some good evidence about the impact of self-testing. Uh, here I'm showing the two guidelines the WHO released, one in 2016, and the latest was just two years ago or one a year and a half ago, uh, where you can see actually the number of evidence. These are randomized control trials. So they, they usually have a very high quality of evidence. And, and you can see the big number of evidence that we have. Uh, so these actually help uh, WHO to to give a very strong recommendation about the potential of self-testing for HIV. And this is where we advocate for countries to use it as an additional approach. Also in the latest guideline in 2018, there were a lot of studies that also um, in, in included um, interviews with the, with the, with the self-testers, you know, with the different key populations, but also with the healthcare workers to get their view on what they think is the most beneficial of self-testing. So I'm not showing all the results of this because it did require a lot of slides to show, but this really showed to the WHO that there is a lot of good evidence, a strong evidence that we should be using this approach for diagnosing more people. And of course, the role of communities is quite important, uh, both to for demand creation, but also for implementation because they, they know their context. So it's very important that the communities are part of these implementation projects. You can go to the next slide, please. This uh, slide is showing you the number of countries that actually have enforced uh, policies to implement self-testing. You can see that as of June, 2020, last year, um, there were 86 countries that have developed the policies to allow the implementation of self-testing. Uh, you can go now to the next slide. It just tells you countries who have developed a policy, but actually when you look at the implementation level, you can see in this graph is showing the the percentage of countries that are actually implementing. So one thing is to have the policy in place. And another one is how much the country has actually absorbed this or put in practice this uh, policy. So here you can see actually that East and Southern Africa, 52% of them have implemented actually 
routine implementation, and also in, in Western and Central Europe and North America, 46% of the other regions, they are much behind the implementation. So we need to do more advocacy in terms of how we can implement these in, in, actually in the countries. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, you know, since the, the WHO recommendation in 2016, a number of products have started to become available. This list is showing you the from the Global Fund, all the products that they have approved for procurement. You can see the number, there are around 10 products more or less that are available, they have been approved, they are available in different markets. The, the ones highlighted in green, are those that have been WHO pre-qualified uh, and the others uh, uh, have approval from other uh, regulatory agencies. Uh, please click, uh, give uh, two clicks. This one is to show you that of all the products that are available, there are only two that actually use the oral fluid. So uh, people call it saliva. Uh, and the rest of them are really blood-based. So it means that you can use a finger prick to do the test. And there are some differences there in the simpl simplicity of um, how you, you carry out the test. Uh, but there are many studies that show both are uh, easy to use and, and, and they can be uh, correctly done by the, the self-testers. The, the other point, important point about all these tests is that the price is different from some of them, you know. So the, for example, the AuraQuick uh, HIV self-test, which is WHO pre-qualified, this one, there was an agreement to be used in 50 countries for preferential pricing. However, when you consider the pricing in, in, in other contexts like high income countries, it becomes an issue. We know it's much more expensive. And of course, uh, the price is an important factor when it comes to the implementation at the country level. So. There is some work to be done there to actually call for more fair price of these diagnostics because we know they can be produced more cheaply, but the manufacturers, they, they rely on a willingness to pay. So of course they will charge higher for high income countries and this can be a bottleneck. Uh, the good news is that the, the recently the Global Fund listed uh, in the last uh, column, you see here the check now HIV self test is from Abbott. This was priced uh, as $1.5 per test, which, you know, it is really the cheapest uh, so far that we, we can get for low middle income countries. Uh, uh, and, and I think this puts pressure on other companies and manufacturers to, to lower the price. So I think that's a good breakthrough, let's say, in terms of the pricing. You can go to the next slide, please. And the next slide is just very quickly to show you that the self-test itself, you know, they are usually tests that have been used the, by healthcare workers, so they have a professional instruction for use. So for the regulatory uh, approval of this test, the companies, they have to simplify the instruction for people who will be doing the test themselves. So they have to be very simple, pictorial, especially for people who cannot read or, so the, in the Nexus, this is just an example of one of the, uh, the self-tests that has been approved, the INSTI. You can go to the next slide. You can see that they, they have all these pictorial instructions, uh, very, very not heavy in text, but more pictures so that people can understand easily the different steps to conduct the test, because this is quite important for self-testing. You can go to the next one. This is Atomo. Uh, which is a finger prick uh, test. Uh, uh, this is also a finger prick test. Uh, yeah, the auto test VH, which is very common in, in the French market. You can go to the next one. The, this is the BioSure, which is similar to the previous one, but is more is marketed in the UK. Uh, the next one, which is which is the most popular, you know, the Aura Quick one, which is the the, the oral based. So you can see that the instructions for use are, are an important element of self testing because they have to be very clear, very short, so that people can do the test very very easily. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, so I, I show you the different tests that are available, the pricing, the instruction for use for HIV. 
But for other, so now when it comes to HCV self-testing, it is relatively new. So of course we have learned a lot from HIV self-testing. So we want to apply the same for other diseases. So for HIV self-testing, there has been some breakthroughs here as well, some progress. So this guideline from 2017, um, like in for the for the HIV self testing policy, at this time there was no evidence to make a recommendation, because remember that for WHO to make a recommendation we have to to assess the evidence that is existing there. So there was a, in this guideline there was a call for innovations, you know, to to reach more people to diagnose more people with hepatitis. So among these innovations, self testing was put there as a potential approach to, to expand testing, uh, but because there was no limited, uh, because there was limited evidence, the uh, recommendation was not done. You can go to the next one. Uh, luckily, you know, uh, with the collaboration of WHO and FINE, which has done an outstanding, you know, um, work on this area, they started to, to fill this gap in, in evidence. And they have done quite a lot of very good studies on the usability and acceptability of HCV self-testing in different populations using some of the products uh, that are used for professional use. And thanks to this uh, data gathering, let's say, or evidence gathering, uh, WHO is going to be um, formulating new evidence for HCV self-testing later this year. You can see here, this is in the website that it is coming up, um, just to say that uh, this evidence, um, mostly of this was the directly from, from studies uh, uh, with self-testing, but some of the recommendations around programmatic outcomes was derived from HIV self-testing because there are so many studies. So we want to be able to streamline there and there are so many commonalities or, or um, to, to be able to extract from, from the HIV self-testing experience. So this is coming up. So watch for, for the guidelines that will coming up, which I think would be great to uh, incentivize countries to, to adopt these policies. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this list is showing you the, the quality assure HCV RDTs from the Global Fund. Uh, in green one, again, they are the WHO pre-qualified ones. They, these all tests can be used uh, by healthcare workers. Yeah, it's professional use. Uh, but the, the last two, please give a click. The, the OraQuick and, and the blood-based test from First Response, which is an Indian manufacturer. These uh, tests, they have come forward with a new version for self-testing. So it, uh, in addition to be used at the health facility level, they have uh, optimized or uh, adapted their instruction for you so that it can be used for self-testing. Please give another click. Uh, another click. Uh, so with all the, as I mentioned before, with all the data and evidence that is generated by fine studies, uh, showing you know uh, whether it's easy to use and how effective it is for self-testing, they are seeking, they are planning to submit their, their, their dossiers for WHO pre-qualification, hopefully this year, so that we can have um, a test that is commercially and approved uh, for self-testing. You can go to the next slide. Uh, you know, in terms of the oral test, I think everybody knows about the oral quickly. Yeah? It's, it's been there since 2012 for HIV. For hepatitis, we have a professional version, but it's been really the monopoly, you know, it's the only oral test uh, that has been there. Um, these are the two ones that I mentioned uh, that will be seeking WHO qualification this year, the oral test and the blood test. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, but then uh, do we have other oral based tests to, to be able to compete with the OraQuick? Because you know, you should, for, for hepatitis especially, they, the price uh, they set is quite high, even for low middle income countries. So I think having competitors, we have two from China that are limited to the Chinese market, but potentially can, can also be, uh, you know, create more competition in this uh, area. And FIND is looking at actually this uh, instruction for use was were developed by, with the help of FIND. 
to make it uh, easy to use and easy to understand. So hopefully there will be some competitors coming up to the market, which I think is good news overall. You can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, now we're jumping from hepatitis. I already give you the overview of the hepatitis now for for the, you know for uh, enabling integration between disease programs uh, I, uh, we think this recommendation also from 2019 from who about the dual tests so these are rapid tests that can die, that can screen for hiv and syphilis the recommendation is mainly for antenatal care for pregnant women because the coverage of self testing in pregnant women is very low for syphilis compared to hiv which is, um, which is a, you know, it shouldn't be the case because the pregnant women should be screened for HIV, syphilis if they come to the same visit. So this is a strong recommendation from WHO to use this test for the screening of pregnant women. However, also there is a consideration in the um, policy about the potential to use this test also for other populations, you know, like populations uh, I am, that are also, of course, um, at risk of syphilis. Uh, there will be more guidance around this, uh, the use of, of tests for key populations uh, with the dual HIV syphilis uh, later this year, uh, but it's potentially already, WHO says uh, there is a potential there. You can go to the next slide. Uh, these are the tests that are currently available for dual HIV syphilis test. Remember at the moment, these tests are used for professional use. It means they, they have to be confined to the health facility level. All of them are blood-based. Um, we have three of them. The prices are quite affordable for low and middle income countries. We don't know how much it can be, or how many, how much countries in, in, in high income countries they can actually use this test in terms of the pricing. Uh, we don't have a good overview about how much it's costing, for example, Europe to do to use this test. But these are the tests that are there, are very simple to use, and actually there is potential also for self testing if you if you can think of it, because it's, it's a lateral flow assay is very simple to do, similar to to the HIV rapid test. You can go to the next one. Finally, I want to talk about the STIs. For STIs, unfortunately, there is currently no recommendations about self-testing. Uh, last year, WHO released these guidelines about uh, self-care interventions, you know, like, you know, for diabetes, we use glucometers to diagnose, uh, to, to screen for or to monitor uh, the, uh, blood glucose and also self-care, you know, you can also put insulin yourself. Uh, however, for testing, um, some of these STIs, for example, the HPV, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, they, this, the antibody test, we don't, they, they are not sufficient to give a diagnosis. So you need molecular or PCR tests, like for COVID, you know, you need a PCR and that gives you a diagnosis. And we don't have, and we don't have that at this point in time. A find is currently working on this area. Uh, about how to facilitate point of care for, for some of these STIs. However, we can still do, you know, with self-collection, WHO uh, strongly um, uh, recommends the use of uh, self-sample collection, that it can be done at home, and then you can refer this to the facility where they, they can do the, the further testing to, to make the final diagnosis. Next slide, please. And these are, again, these the actual recommendation from WHO that you can use self-collection of samples for chlamydia, but also for syphilis uh, and for HPV. And there are different methods, uh, you know, there are different sample collection methods uh, according to the disease, because the disease has different, let's say, uh, anatomical parts where to collect the sample. So there are different recommendations, but uh, procedures, but this is, uh, I think this is a good way to go ahead while, you know, we see more in the market, more simplified diagnostics. And then I think I have the next, uh, my final slide is next. Oh no, it's not the final, but just to say that it, uh, I, sh I show you the map of HIV self-testing adoption here yeah, in terms of policy. And there are many countries now, there are countries that are already doing self-testing um, this is not a policy, but it's a technical requirement from Australia, where they are encourage, encouraging uh, manufacturers to apply for hepatitis B and C, and also for the other diseases for self-tests. Uh, 
So this is actually a good sign that uh, countries are considering self-testing as an important approach. You can go to the next slide. Uh, obviously the holy grail, let's say that what we would want to have uh, more in the future is to have tests that can actually screen uh, for different uh, diseases, right? Uh, so this report is from 2018 from the UNITAID, just giving you, you know, some showing some of the tests that potentially can, can be used for screening HIV, hepatitis, hepatitis B, and even syphilis I, is not included here. So these are there available. We know there is a market there, but unfortunately there is very little evidence how well they work. And of course, if WHO wants to make a recommendation, we need to see studies that show that these tests are accurate, are simple to use, are, and they have an impact in the casket of care. Next slide. I think this is uh, my, my final slide. And it's really just to, to say that, you know, the COVID has been really challenging, but it has also bring some good points about self-care, you know, and, with all the restrictions, the self-care interventions are quite important uh, as a way to facilitate access to care. Um, uh, and also we, we see that there are many um, tests becoming available for the different diseases. And just want to highlight, you know, that these tools are quite cool and many people like to see these tests, uh, but the, the test itself alone is not sufficient if you want to make an impact. So we also need to couple these tests with different approaches to make implementation much easier. And uh, WHO for a long time has been uh, recommending the, the decentralization and task shifting and integration of services for the different diseases to be a, a, a patient centric approach that is used by different countries. So this is really an important component. The tool is good, but it's not enough. So I think uh, my next slide is just to, um, to tell you that there is a very nice uh, application that you can go and this is for HIV testing services where you can go and you can see the different guidelines and you can, it's available in English at the moment and I think in French, but uh, there are all the, all the different recommendations of WHO. So thank you so much. I hope I didn't go too fast and I didn't speak too fast for, for the Russian translator, but thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Emmanuel. We will have a second presentation uh, from Nicole Segi, who is add on what the implications for the regions are. And afterwards we have a joint uh, session for questions to these first two presentations. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just going to reflect on the, the presentation from Emmanuel for our region. Uh, we know that uh, we have significant gaps in the cascade, significant gaps in the proportion of uh, people living with HIV. We know their status, but also an even larger gap in the linkage to, to treatment. Uh, more efforts should be done to increase community-based testing and offer, but also scale up HIV self-testing as an option in order to diagnose uh, people who need it the most. Uh, a number of countries still need to address the legal barriers to allow lay providers to conduct HIV screening. Uh, this is something we need to work on uh, in collaboration with, uh, with all stakeholders. Um, during COVID, as mentioned by, uh, by Emmanuel, the adaptation of testing services, in particularly the use of HIV cell testing, uh, was, uh, was quite constructive, and, uh, but we have to continue that after the, the pandemic um, and really scale up uh, HIV cell testing as an additional option for key population. We have good example from Poland and we other countries have done uh, very good uh, uh, models um, of self-testing organized by community groups. Um, Georgia, just to let you know, we received the, the, the um, online platform. Uh, it's a self-test.ge uh, from Georgia. Uh, that was launched very recently to mitigate the COVID-19 impact on HIV testing. And so it's a solution on uh, self-testing in, in, in Georgia. So just an example. 
We also need to be able to monitor better self-testing and improve the linkage to confirmatory testing after self-testing to understand what happens after someone has self-tested and, uh, and link them to, to care. Um, the linkage is a big problem. Linkage to ART needs to be improved in our region, in particularly in Eastern Europe, Central Asia. Um, many countries uh, still use the Western blot as the confirmatory test, which delays the return of test results. And we have a lot of people lost to follow up in that process. Uh, I'd like to make a call uh, to the community. I think it's an important role of the community to advocate to move away from Western blot in our region and uh, request for faster turnaround time of test results. Uh, if we do not do that, we will not be able to improve so much the cascade. So again, the community has a role to play to request for changes. Integration of HIV, hepatitis, and STI testing, uh, in particularly for key population, is really in, in very important. So uh, Emmanuel showed that we have few options. We have dual HIV, syphilis, uh, RDTs that are available and can be used. Now we have uh, HCV self-test, but the combination, as Emmanuel said, of the three tests is not yet uh, fully recommended and, and available, but it will come at some point. Uh, the message is that uh, for HCV, um, self-test will come soon. Um, and it's also, again, I think a role of the community to request HCV elimination program, because now with the testing tools that we, we have and the simplified treatment that is available through the 12 weeks course of direct acting antivirals, we can really, really eliminate uh, hepatitis C. So again, um, role of the community to uh, request uh, countries governments to, um, to set up uh, strong elimination programs. Finally, um, Emmanuel raised the issue of cost. And in our region, because we don't have, we are not, we are middle income countries, sometimes high income country, we have high prices. So we need to uh, collaborate with key stakeholders and, and get um, work done to decrease the prices. We need to think about all possible options, including pool procurement. So in conclusion, we still have a lot to do to improve the testing uptake and the linkage to care in our region, but we know what needs to be done. We have the tools and with the strong involvement of the community, uh, we can make it. Thank you very much. And we are here, all the team of WHO, uh, from Emmanuel in HQ to Elena and Anton's in Euro, we're here to answer your question in the chat. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the chat, uh, I've seen there were, first of all, uh, some uh, um, comments rather than questions. There were some comments that women need to be screened also for hepatitis B, uh, the potential of triple rapid tests, which was then also mentioned, was commented on. And Nadia, we have a question oh, of understanding. Yeah, maybe I just want to, to, to mention, to quickly answer it about the, the, the need of pregnant women for hepatitis B. This is, this is also my oversight in terms of that, uh, you know, WHO has the triple elimination efforts, which of course is the elimination of HIV, syphilis and hepatitis B. And this is a very important, and there's been recent recommendations about hepatitis B. Uh, and certainly, yeah, if we would have a test, for example, surf, surface antigen, but also the point of care for viral load for hepatitis B, these would help achieving these targets. So absolutely agree with the comment and just want to clarify that WHO is pushing countries to for this triple elimination. So it, it's quite important. Okay. And I can see there with uh, a comment from um, Maria 
that there was done a quick overview of the situation of HIV uh, self-testing in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So there is also a publication and you have included in the chat a link. And uh, I think there were no further questions of understanding. If so, please raise your hand. But I think it was more comments. And uh, I would say we continue with the next presentation uh, from, so, sorry, I had to look at the right sheet of paper now. Uh, Sonjel Shilton from FIND, she's going to speak on the elimination of HCV via high impact testing approaches. So that's also what was already mentioned, the challenge around HCV. And afterwards, we have uh, time for a content-driven discussion. Great. Thank you very much, Frank. I'm just setting the presentation to be right. All right, great. So thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. So I am Sanyel. I'm the Deputy Head of Hepatitis for Access from FIND, which is the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics. Um, and I'll be speaking on the elimination of hepatitis C via high impact testing approaches. I'm just going to set my timer so I don't go too long. Um, you may not be familiar with FIND, some of you may be, but just a quick overview of who we are. We are focused, we're a diagnostic nonprofit focused on bridging the gap for uh, diagnostics from R&D to research and development to delivery. Basically, wanting to create high quality diagnostics that can be used globally. Um, there's a large need for high quality diagnostics, particularly in the global south. Um, and so we work on that. We are a WHO collaborating center uh, for laboratory strengthening, as well as a SAGE in vitro diagnostic member. And we're also 13485 ISO certified for quality management for in vitro diagnostics clinical trials. So we have offices uh, throughout the world, and we do primarily work, as I said, in the global south or low and middle income countries. Um, so we don't tend to work uh, maybe in some parts of, of Europe, but we do work in, in others. So a quick briefing on, on hepatitis C. I know that many of you are uh, familiar and aware, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. It's estimated that there are 71 million people living with hepatitis C. Um, WHO has made uh, 2030 elimination targets, as Nicole was saying, because now the DAAs, the treatment is available and is very effective, and the price is coming down from over $80,000 when it was first introduced to less than $100 in some countries. Um, so now the challenge is finding the people to put on treatment. So of those infected, less than 20% have currently been diagnosed. And we are a long way to go to reach the 2030 elimination targets. So we know that um, there's around 1.8 million new cases every year and over 56 uh, million missing people who are living with hepatitis C who are not yet diagnosed. So what does diagnosing hepatitis C look like? Well, WHO has come out with a simplified algorithm that was already alluded to, I think, um, earlier. And it starts with a single assay. So a laboratory testing, such as an ELISA, or a quality-assured RDT for serological testing. Now, uh, when people acquire hepatitis C, around 25% of people can spontaneously cure. Um, so they do not need treatment, but the remaining 75% will be viremic and do need treatment. So therefore, if somebody uh, is RDT reactive or serologically reactive, they need to have a prompt or reflexed RNA test or core antigen test to um, see if they're viremic and they need treatment. And then WHO recommends uh, liver staging, uh, treating all with pangenotypics. So this means getting rid of genotype testing. And then one test of cure, it's called SVR12. So this is a test of cure done 12 to 24 weeks after treatment completion using an RNA test. So you may notice here that it is four simple steps. And what's also I'd like to draw your attention to, there's only two 
tests of viremia. So only two RNA tests. There are no RNA tests recommended for monitoring and there is no RNA test recommended for end of treatment. Okay, so what do we need to do? We've got 56 million people or more that we need to find. Well, we need to find them and we need to link them to care in a cost efficient manner. Um, so this is very, very similar, right, from what we know and the lessons we've learned from long e experience now with, with HIV. And similar, how can we do it? So decentralized targeted screening at places where people already go for care with reflex testing for RNA and liver staging and decentralized treatment, the, the one-stop shop. So what is a one-stop shop? You're probably familiar with it, but just a brief it's where a participant or a recipient of care can go to receive everything they need for the hepatitis care that they don't have to move. And it can use existing infrastructure. You don't necessarily need a fancy $17,000 point of care machine. You can use a variety of techniques to reach people where they are. And we need to think about the patient journey here. We have to make it easy for the recipient of care. If you move them, you lose them. I mean, we, we, we see it uh, across the spectrum, right, of, of conditions. And it's particularly important in hepatitis because in hepatitis C, we are asking the recipient of care to do us a favor. We want them to go through all of this process, take time out of their day, do this before they are feeling any effects, before they are fe feeling any, any illness um, from the hepatitis C. So we've really got to think about how we can make it as accessible for the patient as possible. And there's lots of evidence that one-stop shop works. So there's a recent systematic review that's been published of over 100, of 142 studies, which showed you know, higher rates of linkage of care and treatment uptake when doing a, a one-stop shop. So I'll show you some few, two examples, outcomes and impacts of various testing approaches for hepatitis C that I thought might be relevant um, for this audience. So these two examples come from our Head Start project, that's the Hepatitis C Elimination Through Access to Diagnostics. It was a project that was running from 2017 until two weeks ago. Um, so we've just completed. And one part of the project was looking at Hepatitis C diagnostic models that could increase impact of service delivery. So in Georgia, we did a lot of work in Georgia, but one of the, the studies we did was among eight harm reduction sites, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. In India, we introduced a simplified decentralized service delivery among the hospitals in Delhi. Uh, in Manipur, we used a point of care technology, the gene expert, to provide one-stop shop community based testing and treatment. And then in Punjab, we integrated into existing ART clinics, hepatitis C uh, screening and diagnosis. In Malaysia, I'll talk a little bit uh, on Malaysia as well. We introduced um, rapid diagnostic tests into the primary care system to decentralize testing and treatment. And then in Myanmar, we used the gene expert for a one-stop shop, um, focusing on people who inject drugs as well as um, Liver, liver patients in a charity clinic. So overall, we had 150,000 people tested, 30,000 confirmatory tests done, and 18,000 people cured. So to speak about Georgia, we partnered with the Georgian NCDC, as well as Georgian Harm Reduction Network Health Research Union, and all of the harm reduction sites. And we integrated hepatitis C confirmatory testing into harm reduction sites. You can see here on the map, it was spread geographically across the country. We didn't want to focus just on Tbilisi when we wanted to, to make sure we could expand. And during the course of the study, the government decentralized treatment to the select harm reduction sites. And this is something that we see time and time again uh, throughout our work and other people's work. If you manage to decentralize the testing and you show the government the loss to follow up they're getting, if you have nice solid decentralized testing, but the participant still has to move for a treatment, um, you can convince the government that possibly one-stop shop or bringing the treatment close to the patient is more impactful and also much more cost-effective. The purpose of this study overall was basically to figure out how to combat the loss to follow-up that was being seen. Before the study was started, participants who would go to the harm reduction sites um, for rapid diagnostic testing of hepatitis C 
over 50% of those who were positive by the rapid test were not making it to that next step for the confirmatory test. So all of the stakeholders in Georgia were really keen to understand how they could reduce that, that quite large loss to follow up. So we um, had a non-randomized design uh, interventional study. And in the first arm and four harm reduction sites, we put the gene expert at the harm reduction site. So um, participants would have an, if RDT positive, they would immediately have blood drawn for the point of care test, um, you would get the results and then be referred to the next treatment clinic for, for treatment and care. In arm two, at harm, two harm reduction sites, we, um, after the participant was RDT positive, then they did reflex blood draw. The blood was sent to a centralized laboratory. And then the participant was contacted back with their results and referred to the treatment center for further care. And then arm three was the, the standard of care, uh, wherein a participant, if RDT positive at the harm reduction site, would be referred to the um, treatment clinic for the further viremia testing and care. And so quickly, what we saw was um, basically that arm one and arm two, where participants did not have to move for the test, had very high rates of viremia test. Arm one, it was 100% of participants received a viremia test. Arm two, 99.8%. Also to notice though, arm three at 91% is not so bad either. And part of this could be that in our study, we covered the cost of all diagnostics. At the time that our study was starting, the Georgian government was just, um, removing the price barriers. So they had just said that, okay, RNA tests would be free. Um, and then during the course of the study, they actually removed all of the costs for all of the remaining diagnostics. So this could be compelling info information that um, removing price barriers is also a very effective way to increase um, retention and care cascade. So it was 100% in arm one, where we had that point of care. And um, Every participant but one stayed around to get the results. So they, everyone waited an hour and a half to get the result, except for one person. And um, in arm two, the reason why it's 99.8% is there was one participant who had uh, venous access difficulties. So the harm reduction staff, they were not able to blood draw. So they did have to refer him to confirm it, to a, a clinic for, for further blood draw. So we see viremia similar across all arms. Treatment initiation also fairly similar, completed treatment the same, eligible for SVR, SVR completed. And what I wanna highlight here is the achieved SVR. This is quite, quite great from 97 to 99% achieved SVR. Um, and this is also to note, you know, 75, 77% of participants did report um, actively injecting drugs during the time of the study. And the SVR results are very strong. This goes to the very large body of evidence we now have that SVR achievement among people who inject drugs is as good, if not better sometimes, than general population. So the key takeaways um, is that the on-site confirmatory test and the reflex sample referral both resulted in statistically significant increases. So you, you can make that high linkage without necessarily putting that large capital outlay for new tests, for new equipment. Uh, SVR rates were strong. There was a very strong relationship between the harm reduction site staff and the beneficiaries. Um, and test and treat isn't possible on the same day in Georgia, but hopefully they're moving towards that. So quickly in the interest of time, I'll just really quickly highlight Malaysia. The reason why I brought up Malaysia, it's not within the European context, but the thing is, is the Malaysian health system is, I think has a lot of similarities to a lot of European health systems. And one of those similarities is they have a very strong centralized lab network. And so they are really hesitant to go for RDTs or something like that um, because they would always just like to do it on the, on the, on the laboratory-based equipment. So this kind of has some parallels, this discussion about, you know, Western blot for HIV and, and some things that are happening in Europe. So we integrated hepatitis C RDTs into 25 primary healthcare clinics, working with the Ministry of Health, the DNDI. Um, and what was great was our PI for the study was the head of hepatology for the Ministry of Health. So he was able to take the real-time information and make a lot of really important course corrections to the national hepatitis strategy. When we started, there was this idea that we needed to have a very centralized hepatitis care delivery service, two ELISAs and a core antigen tiebreaker for screening, so very complicated. 
we introduced IDTs into the primary health care, and then the participant was supposed to move to the district hospital for RNA test and treatment. Now, the government saw the huge loss of follow-up when participants had to move from the primary health care to the district hospital, and so they actually adjusted things, and during the course of the study, they brought the treatment down to the primary health care clinic as well. Um, and after the study, they simplified everything, so now it's a one-stop shop. Um, so just quickly to say, we did a targeted screening approach. The general prevalence in Malaysia is 2.2%. And we asked um, for participants to come forward on screening in a risk-based approach, which yielded us a prevalence of 13.6%. The reason why this is important is because by doing a targeted approach, we only needed to screen about seven people to find one person who's RDT reactive, which cost $6. If we had just kind of done a screen everyone approach, we would have needed to screen 45 to find an RDT reactive, and that would have cost 37. The quality of SVR was the same at the district hospital and the primary health care, so no losing quality of care along. And so the key takeaways here are just that primary health care treatment helped to um, treat, the, have a statistically significant higher completion rates. SVR was strong along all. Targeted screening approach results in lower costs. Um, and so what's next? Further decentralization. So how do they get the testing now to the community-based organizations? And they are also exploring, you know, how do we, how do they best use uh, hepatitis C uh, antibody self-testing? So super, um, super quick. I'm sorry, I'm trying to help us make up some time. I'll just, I have like a few more slides. Um, so this is not a find program, but I just wanted to highlight Cone from Manipur. They're a community-based organization and they've done some really fantastic work. So the COVID lockdowns in Manipur State in India were particularly intense. And what Cone did was they, they served the bridge to make one-stop shop possible. They worked with the harm reduction sites and the opioid substitution therapy sites and the state hepatitis program and basically brought all of the treatment and everything down to the harm reduction sites. Um, I think it was really fantastic. And they did this with minimal resources and a very difficult environment. And they were able to link 86% of recipients of care with hepatitis C treatment. So my last slide is just some discussion points and speaking with policymakers. We have a simplified algorithm for hepatitis C. It's recommended by WHO and EASL, right? Because I know sometimes there's perception of, you know, well, maybe that, you know, we need European guidelines. Well, the European guidelines also say it should be simplified. And um, we can learn a lot, right, from all of the successes and some of the continued challenges of HIV, and we can apply that to hepatitis C. So something I didn't have a time to talk about today, but it is important is the cost. There is this tool that we developed with Harvard and WHO that you can plug in your country specific information and get the cost for person diagnosed using different diagnostic strategies. Um, and what we see is that if you do hepatitis C service delivery, it's almost always gonna save you money in the long run. Not only is it cost effective, it's almost always cost saving. Um, yeah, okay, so thank you. Sorry about my, my kind of quicking at the end, but I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Actually, there wasn't a need to, you were doing just perfect, actually. <laughs> I just wanted to write your message. Uh, first of all, I wanted to ask if there are some questions of understanding regarding the presentation from Sonia. I've checked the chat function. There was a discussion about a website, uh, but I couldn't see any questions of understandings. So I would actually then jump into the discussion, uh, really trying to summarize all three presentations. I would say there is technologies uh, and techniques. It's improving. We have the perspectives of Triple and uh, also these tremendous uh, perspectives in H HCV. But on the other side, I think we also know there are practical limitations on the ground. Uh, 
And we had a lot of uh, also some case studies about community testing. And I would like to start the discussion with the question, what is supporting and what is hindering actually community in providing self-testing? And I know having looked through the um, list of participants, we have some representatives with experiences on that field and area. And first of all, I would like to ask actively uh, Magda from Poland if she could respond here. And I really would like to ask all the other participants representing community organizations really to make either oral statements, but if you don't feel confident in speaking up, write your thoughts into the chats, what is actually supporting and hindering you on the ground providing self-testing through community services. Magda, what's your experience? Thank you, Frank, and it's a very big pleasure to be here with you and listen to all this presentation. Uh, I'm a CEO of Foundation for Social Education from Poland and also coordinator of VCT Center in Warsaw and Mobile Testing Unit. And this year, as uh, Nicole said, uh, we implement uh, last year the self-testing. So my experience of testing, it's more than 15 years from Poland, and I see several points. And especially from a uh, general perspective, there are a lot of local diagnostic rec um, restrictions, especially uh, of testing for non-healthcare um, services. And this is very often uh, block uh, a lot of initiative for uh, community to do uh, to implement the new possibility of testing. It was similar with self-testing in Poland and also rapid tests that diagnostic experts in many places do not agree for this kind of testing that are not so good as they uh, thought that you should be in the diagnostic centers. Second thing, it's the country's restriction and also what Nicole said about Western blot. This is something that we, uh, I as an expert also fighting in Polish uh, level to stop using Western blood and uh, go directly to the HIV clinic because it's too long time and we lost in care. And we have also data from test and keeping care research that was made with uh, Warsaw Clinic and Professor Kowalska that shows that it really stopped people coming for the clinic. And other thing, well, what is uh, supportive, it's, about, uh, it's access and also knowledge. And we have to remember that uh, the community have a huge experience, but also knows the background and uh, know the situation from the key population from the ground. So this is the um, expert group who can choose what was what is their best uh, part of testing. And for example, from my experience, we knew that in the VCT center, we do not see uh, injection drug users. So it was the reason why we open mobile unit and going to them to testing and check it. But still, that what, what is the challenge? Uh, it's linking to care and also how to do that, that um, this uh, help will be um, organized for those who will be uh, age, um, the positive results. So we have to choose the people who knows the situation, but also we have to go on with the new perspective. And uh, I think uh, the, the biggest uh, hiring uh, from the community, it's very often uh, give us access to do what we know and uh, uh, we know exactly where and uh, uh, where we can do it. And uh, very often the block is the um, government or uh, local uh, experts. And uh, I think from the beginning of the discussion, maybe it will be the first point what, what it will, I would like to mention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted maybe just to add in one of the first presentation, it was actually said that the community involvement uh, in the self-testing is very important to reach the aims of the cascade in a certain way. Uh, 
uh, the the very ambitious uh, goals we have never might be reached if we don't de decentralize, if we don't provide self-testing, and if we don't provide community uh, testing. Just giving you an example, you refer to legal aspects in my country in Austria. The laws regarding HIV testing were drafted, I would, uh, I think it was in the early 90s, and they never were changed. And so the whole legal text is not reflecting the technological change. But also the problem was the new technologies, uh, I don't know how to say it, it's a different market. So someone else is making money than with the laboratory blood testing. And so there was also a strong lobbying by certain people pretending that the new tests are not good, but actually they were only trying to defend their old market. And I think we as community advocates have to be very careful about that. And uh, when so-called experts talk about evidence and quality, very often it's a kind of lobbying of um, their own interests. I've seen there is also Andre from Ukraine in the participants list, and I would have this, nobody's raising the hand at the moment, but maybe Andre, if you're listening to us, uh, I would assume that you have some something to say on that. And maybe all the other participants, I would like to invite you to raise your hands if you have a say on what is uh, supporting and hindering the community provision of self-testing. Andre? He went lost. But I can see Daniel from Portugal. Daniel? Yes, good afternoon. Hello, uh, I, I, I'm jumping onto you, but I would assume also that you from a community perspective would have a very, uh, a, a, an opinion on that, what is supporting and hindering community provided self-testing. Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the issues are things that we've been uh, struggling for a while now. It's uh, in some situations changing regulatory approaches, as you were mentioning, also around technologies like uh, integrating new technologies and ensuring that the new diagnostics options that are available are in fact implemented. There is a big issue around funding, uh, especially funding if we're looking at some of the I mean, th there's a huge array of things around. So if we're looking at implementing comprehensive programs, uh, they require money. If we're speaking about increasing availability of, um, of community testing that requires project funding, it requires uh, equipment funding, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the, the, the challenges kind of have been remaining the same. There has been progress, of course, in, in some areas more than others. But we do continue to struggle with, um, in some senses, the basics. Uh, and I think that the fact that we have um, targets now at a global level that 30% of services, for example, should be provided by community in terms of the HIV response also helps adv advocacy. Um, but we do need to continue to insist on these because we have skills on the ground already and many of them could be better used and are still not being better used on account of in many places regulatory issues in other places lack of funding okay thank you uh, uh anise raised her hand yes i was just wondering listening to the presentation of, uh, of emmanuel nicole and um, and Samuel, that there is so much evidence uh for of the different tools that could be that could be used, there are many guidelines coming up, and I think the COVID crisis has also shown also to the to the public the use of self-test um, 
like has raised in the, the awareness. And so I was wondering like why there is not more discussion even at European level, at EU level, commission level, because HIV, hepatitis have to me seemed completely disappeared from any kind of discussion. I understand there was the emergency around COVID, but I was wondering whether that's something maybe we should, uh, we should stress politically uh, with the commission leadership to address these. Also because, Nicole, you mentioned poor procurement. Um, though I understand the poor procurements for at EU, le at commission level are very complicated. And uh, so maybe that's not the right mechanism, but, um, but that's something we as community can also push on the sort of convincing governments or reluctant governments to let go or I think uh, just to answer your question, I think because of the COVID situation, there is kind of uh, the agenda of, uh, of HIV is getting a little bit uh, sidelined, not only HIV, but many other conditions. But um, I think uh, with the EU, we, we, we have to, with all of, of the uh, entities, we have to try to refocus uh, on, on our programs also. And... Um, and request for more political commitment to the elimination. And uh, for a testing issue, we have suffered more from uh, testing disruption in our region than treatment disruption for people already on treatment. So even if we link the discussion to the co to COVID pandemic, we need to restore testing at least as it was before COVID. We are not sure it's yet the case and we need to catch up. Um, for what we lost during the, the lockdowns, et cetera. So the testing part in the discussion around the elimination is very important. Uh, agree fully with you. We need to, to come back to the, put the HIV on, back on, on track in, in the discussion with the commission. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel, would you like to add something? Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree. You know, the 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 COVID, uh, as I said before, it presents a lot of opportunities to strengthen some of the service delivery models, and we've seen in many countries the COVID adaptations for testing, but also treatment. Uh, the all countries are already adapting to it, you know. So, for example, for treatment, they already instead of dispensing, I don't know, in Europe is usually one month to month to come for your HIV treatment. They already extending. In some countries in the south, they're already doing it to six months. So this has pushed them to implement these new service delivery models that we've been advocating for quite a while. So I think it's a catalytic, is a momentum to, if, and also the Global Fund has recently released the, the, the COVID, you know, they received 5 million from the US to do COVID adaptations. And we're trying to, uh, for countries to try to, to use these funds to do to keep the COVID adaptation with these simplified services, the real models, but those just for COVID, but to keep it as a long term um, uh, project that, for example, soft testing or, or simplification of treatment delivery can be kept in the long run because this is a winner in the end. So I, I do think we have to take this COVID uh, period as, as, as an opportunity to implement those, all those things that we've been uh, advocating for quite a while. So, but of course uh, we do need uh, the community voice there and the push to be able to call for these adaptations. And yeah, so fully agree with you. Maybe again, just a comment from my side or the thought, uh, maybe there is a difference with the COVID testing uh, I just grabbed my COVID self-testing, you know, and I receive four of them every uh, month. Uh, and there is a difference because I don't receive that through a community organization. It's the private sector. It's the supermarket. It's a business. So in my country, in Austria, you go to the supermarket, do your shopping, pick up the monthly for COVID testings, and you hand them in in the supermarket. 
But again, it's the access, the access point. So for uh, maybe I wouldn't even mind to pick up my STI testings the same way at the supermarket. And we have never thought about that. But for some people, really the linkage to the community is very important. And I think also we, there was this wording about decentralization, decentralization but it should be maybe also a diversification of access. Where do people feel comfortable to get access to the self-testing? Because I think what COVID changed is that we are not ashamed anymore picking up a health test at the supermarket, which I think some years ago was more taboo. But I was also, I would like to include one uh, question in the discussion. So just imagine the perfect world. There are perfect tests available and easy access. We still have the other problem with the linkage from the self-testing to care. I don't know who mentioned that, but we have actually heard a lot about good practices about providing the self-testing. Uh, I was wondering if you are aware about good practices of linking then the self-testing with care. So I'm just throwing that into the discussion and I can see that Magda has raised her hand. Thanks. My raise of hand was from the uh, previous uh, question, but also I can add the good practice from the uh, this one, what you ask about linkage to care. For example, when we opened the self-testing last year, uh, it was my point to have also um, uh, info line because I know that people have do not good knowledge about the testing. So if you would like to order the test, you have to call us. And when you have the result, you have to also call us and say what was the result and what is the next step. Of course, it doesn't work for 100%, but still there is an option and people can call and it works. Of course, it's still not enough, but but there is an option. But I also uh, um, add for the, uh, the, the question and point of Anis what said that we have to also ask or um, put the question to EU or for uh, um, expert, what is the real situation right now with community-based testing in Europe? Because there is no data, and from my knowledge and from uh, our ex experience from EETG also, we know that in many places, organization right now are closed or they have much less money than uh, before COVID. And for many of them, there will, there will be a problem to survive. And also the government want to cut money because of COVID and do not want to pay for testing for STIs and uh, hepatitis. So we have to be very careful because from one side, of course, we have to and need to look for the new technology, but still we need a basic service that is organized by community and it should edit what works um, very good and should s survive uh, even though that the COVID it's uh, right now everywhere and every uh, healthcare um, ministry ministry of health mainly concentrate on it and uh, so so I think it's also uh, we should mapping the Europe what is right now the real situation with community-based testing map of places. Sorry, anyone wants to comment? I want to comment, Frank. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. I, I see here we have two representatives from WHO. Um, uh, my question is directly to them. Does the WHO has any specific recommendation how to make effective linkage to care in terms of HIV self-testing? Yes, so um, just to briefly answer you, the, there was a recent systematic review on the impact or the different intervention surveys, the delivery models for HIV self-testing, where different approaches were considered uh, uh, trying to link uh, the results. Uh, so the systematic review shows that there are different approaches, you know, uh, for linking to care, uh, but I think uh, highlighting uh, that coincides very well with this COVID time is about 
the technology innovations that we have in front of us, not only for the products for tests, but also when we think about the virtual interventions, e-health, m-health, and virtual interventions have become such a strong a tool to be able to deal with all the, 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 the disruptions. So in this systematic review, again, uh, you know, there were different strategies to reach, to link patients to care, such as, you know, sending them an SMS or giving them um, uh, some incentives to be, to come back to the facility if they were positive. Uh, this uh, systematic review is already published. So I think it's in the, in the, in the public domain and, uh, but really, the 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 role of virtual interventions or M Health it becomes so important in these times, uh, and there are different models uh, that you can use to be able to 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 gap uh, to bridge the gap for linkage to care. So yeah, there is definitely some um, uh, some of this is also uh, in the 2019 uh, WHO guidelines that call for social networking testing so that you can actually use your network, again, through virtual interventions to reach to those and, uh, and link them to care. So there are different uh, recommendations from, uh, from the WHO. If you want, you can go to the website and there are very uh, short uh, policy briefs that explain you the different approaches that you could potentially use for, for linking patients to care. Uh, yeah, so I hope this answers your question. I don't know if Nicole, uh, you want to add up. Uh, yes, I, I, and I, I will be very grateful if you can share the systematic review. From my point and uh, from my experience of HIV self practice among people who inject drug, uh, I can say that uh, it's rather difficult to, uh, to ensure effective linkage to care among drug, among drug users in comparison with MSM population because um, they have different uh, uh, capacities uh, regarding using gadgets uh, or uh, internet communication and providing some online feedback. Um, they need more direct face-to-face -face connection to provide the uh, um, information what the testing result was. So uh, I would be very helpful, uh, useful. it will be very useful to, show the specific recommendation for drug user community, how to increase uh, linkage to care among those population. Okay, thank you. There is also a longer co a comment from Maria Malagova. I wanted to ask, would you like to speak about your comment or should we read it out? Yeah, I can try to speak. I'm just not sure if I have a very good connection. Uh, I can, can hear you perfectly. Perfect. Great. Thank you. So it's just a very quick thought. And basically, Maka has just said uh, what I was trying to say. I wasn't sure what if she's going to say it herself. Uh, so when you asked about um, what's helping and what's hindering, uh, I just thought... Uh, of uh, some work that we've been doing in Ukraine and um, in other countries of uh, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, uh, including on self-testing, but not limited to self-testing. And uh, the reality that we have to do it now online. Uh, and on one hand, like in our uh, today's world, everything and everyone is online and it shouldn't be such a big issue. But it has actually turned out to be an issue. And as like Maka said, because we have to work uh, specifically with some um, uh, different populations and uh, key populations and that um, in countries of uh, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, especially in Central Asia, it's not always um, like the, the tactics that are being used uh, to work with these groups and reach uh, to them and uh, with self-testing and with other programs and link them to care. Uh, do not always work for Central Asian countries. And, um, and yeah, so we, we kind of lack information about how to best uh, kind of utilize uh, the resources. So we are developing websites and apps and everything, but we are not uh, confident about how to transfer these apps and websites and to link the key populations to these apps and websites so that they actually use effectively in loss. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And I like, it seems you're in a playground. Uh, that's what I like <laughs> about these new webinars, that you can join us from a playground where happy children are playing. I can see that Elena has raised her hand and also Sonia. So I would first ask Elena and then Sonia. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi everyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in a playground, but I was recently on a bike, so I just joined, joined from my uh, from my home. Um, what I wanted to say to complete also the discussion to like comment on the discussion uh, regarding the linkage to care that Mark, Maka raised. Um, I wanted to point the attention that in different countries can be different. Uh, we have a big diversity in the region between west and east and the center. And in the East, uh, if in the, in the Central Europe and, and Western Europe, um, we think, those that work in the East, that the collaboration is better in between NGOs and governmental institutions and overall the government um, benefiting still from some governmental support and to the community um, programs like financial or uh, space allocation for certain projects and so on. The, that is not always the, the case in the East, as much as they try. Uh, so I guess for the linkage to care, uh, when we talk about the Eastern countries, it's also the matter of assuring all those paperwork and um, specific um, regulations that regulate this link. It's basically, because I heard from a lot of countries when we go on missions, they say, Without us, they lose them or follow up. We basically take the people from the community, offer them testing, bring them by hand to the specialized institution to, to test and confirm the results. And then if nothing is done by the governmental institutions, there are loss of follow up. So basically these roles of certain, uh, of certain institutions uh, in the... Uh, community-based projects and certain institutions is not very well delineated. You know, uh, everybody's trying to do as much and not more. So for, uh, for certain countries, it's very important that there is a systemic approach and some kind of like uh, a way to remove the structural barriers that exist also at the governmental institutions uh, level so that they undertake a little bit of more responsibilities. And I would um, dare to remind myself, actually, when I worked with uh, partnerships with the US and Euro Eastern Europe and so on, um, I remember uh, doctors working in New York saying when they reached um, serving a thousand people, the care started, the care provision and services started being very, a, a very different, you know, dimension. They needed to, to, to think about creating small uh, assistance units that will go from the clinics to the families of those problem, uh, you know, vulnerable groups and so on and, and monitor them, how they are doing, you know, after the first test and so on. So it's not just to, to say, okay, they reached the care and this is as much as we do. And unfortunately, communities are, are still caring much more of the overload like this. So if advocacy can be also oriented into this direction to kind of increase the role of the institutions to also reach communities, that, that is probably uh, where we, we have to look for. And uh, last but not least is the funding thing. I guess every time we talk about that, but we lack information to help all of us to advocate better for putting more budgets into the HIV, okay. also self-testing. As you say, okay, we, we want to invite the private sector, but they are all operating with this. How do, what, what do we gain with that? So if we show better by modeling of how many lives are, you know, we gain by investing a certain amount into uh, providing, let's say, better tests, better diagnostics, then the dialogue would be easier. Over, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, uh, I will hand over to Sonyel, and I can see from the speakers also, Nicole raised her hand. I think this might be the last two statements then. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Frank. So I'll just try and be brief. I have a, a few thoughts or responses, I think, to a lot of this really good discussion. And I think the, the linkage point on the self-testing that Maka brought up, I, it's, I think it is important. And I think because the majority of the evidence on HIV self-testing is not from people who inject drugs. And so a lot of the thinking is, is about other population groups. And so I think it will be important to think about that specific population group. And perhaps this is where some nice synergies can happen with when we're generating operational evidence on hepatitis C self-testing, right? Because we know that that's usually, that's, we'll be looking at people who inject drugs a lot, right? So how, how can we do some cross learnings there? So, so maybe that could be interesting. And then I think on, just on the point of funding more broadly, I think that Daniel brought it up first. I'm wondering, is there any way to leverage to leverage this idea about pandemics to try and get more funding, right? Like can community-based organizations, I know that some community-based organizations, I can't speak for, for, for Europe, but I know in South America and I know in, in Southeast Asia, they were actually really instrumental in in continuing outreach to a lot of these groups so, and also in South Africa as well. So could, could community-based organizations leverage their position and say, okay, look, give us money, not necessarily for, for what we're doing now, but because we could be the first lines, we could provide you sentinel surveillance. If you expand our testing capacities, the next time we have another COVID, if we're there and ready, we can help to, to contain it more. I, I don't know if that's a pipe dream or, or something that would be possible. I just wanted to throw it out there. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I would now ask Nicole for a short statement. We are running out of time. I can see Daniel also raised his hand. So I will include him for a short statement. And then Anise from ERTG will close with the next step. And hopefully five minutes past half, we can close the meeting. Nicole. Yeah, I'd like to reflect on the need to find uh, ways to improve linkages after self-testing for people who inject drugs. Um, maybe, I don't know if FIND is interested, but maybe we could join forces to, or WHO could um, support, uh, um, just uh, support some kind of uh, implementation research on, on, on good ways to, to do these linkages uh, using specific technology or any support. So uh, we don't have much money, but we could try to to find some uh, some and document what is the because trying things is is good but we need to monitor the impact uh, so that's that's where we could play together but we can discuss together uh, Sonia on on, on that um, last point from my side is uh, to go back to the financing of community interventions um, you will see in June we we will. Um, work on the next strategy for HIV, global and also the regional plans. We'll have some discussions. Um, we are for the region, for Europe, we are more uh, going through the strategic vision of uh, integrated approach for people uh, living with HIV and key population. So meaning people-centered care. And if we push for a vision for the regional plans to be more uh, people-centered, it will drive the whole discussion about improving more uh, the, the support to community-based organizations for, for, the, for the... So I think it's very important in the post-2020 agenda to have a strategic vision of what we want for Europe, and that will drive the funding. So it's just a call for uh, the community to think about it. In June, we'll have a meeting uh, and we will discuss that. And we may need community members to uh, speak. Um, we, have a, we have a concentrated epidemic in our region. We need the community to speak on what they need. And then the whole thing will drive towards more uh, uh, community-based uh, type of uh, uh, response. So that was just a preliminary information. You're muted, uh, Frank. Uh, so I would like to ask Daniel for his statement and he will close with his perspective, the discussion. 
Thank you very much. So <clears throat> um, going back to uh, some of the points that Saniel raised, I mean, I think that this issue of uh, resources is critical, of course. Um, well noted that the the strategy is ongoing and uh, happy to see that unfold. I think that we have something, I mean, it, it, it we have a relatively small group here. So let me kind of try and push you into thinking also given the people who are in the room, like where should we focus? Because there, I mean, it's obvious that there's still a lot to do. I think that the issue that Nicole mentioned of the integrated approach and what Sonyal was mentioning about community being frontline of the response as they were in COVID and as community organizations have been in several, uh, even other non-health areas is kind of critical here. I mean, COVID showed us very clearly that our, our health systems are not prepared for this, type of, for this type of thing. We don't have the infrastructure to respond to a health emergency of this scale. I mean, it, no one could be prepared, of course, but the lessons, and this was also touched earlier in the discussion, the lessons we took there need to be maintained on the one hand, yes, and need to be expanded. I mean, we saw models of care being implemented by pressure of COVID that we have been defending for years. So I think that also speaks to the issue of uh, why are we not doing what the evidence says it works? So again, the issue of evidence-based policies can also, should also be very high on the agenda. And we have more proof to document that now in a lot of different countries. I do think we need to follow up with linkage to care, but in Europe, uh, all, all the points of the, cascare, of the cascade need, still need investment. So we can't lose track of the others, even though we're focusing on, uh, on our specifics. But to, to wrap up, I, I mean, uh, I think we, uh, maybe the meeting report will also help on that. I, I think we need to identify what, uh, what are our first next steps? And I think that this narrative, we do need to find a narrative. And this narrative that we've been pushing in Europe, in Europe around integrated service provision is a good one. It makes a lot of sense. There were a lot of options open for the general population with COVID. There's a lot of stuff being discussed now in the general public that was not before. So it gives us space also to push this, but we need to find effective ways of um, taking this these discussions into national public opinion. Be the, the transfer from the guidance to actual practice is, in my opinion, one of one of our main concerns over the next coming years. Okay, thank you very much. I would also already like to thank all the speakers and all the people from the participants that raised their words and would hand over for a very last short statement to Anis from ETG. Uh, who is going to wrap up and uh, give us an information about the follow-up on this webinar. Anis. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, first of all, everyone, for a very rich uh, discussion and for the presenters for presenting the, the evidence, the, the upcoming guidelines that could be used and the technologies that could be used um, uh, for for advocacy or for actual testing. Um, so what after this meeting, we'll, uh, we'll share the slides. Um, we'll also prepare a short report uh, with the key takeaways, um, which will be uh, shared to the, to the people who registered, but, uh, but also uh, broader uh, communities and you will be free to, to forward it. Um, some of the, the points will be, uh, will be further discussed at the HEP HIV meeting where we have, um, we will be having a, a, a meeting, um, a side meeting with communities and, um, and, and companies. And we hope, um, in, in the, um, in the autumn to also look into ways to reduce prices for, um, self-testing diagnostics, because as it was mentioned, um, one of the price, like the cost is, is an issue. Um, and given, as it was mentioned, that funding of community centers are, is not guaranteed or, or, or being cut, I think that will be an increasing um, issue. So on that note, as you all probably have to go, we will be following up uh, with a report and um, the sort of follow-up action point from for EATG and together with uh, with partners. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you again, all the participants and the speakers, and have a very nice afternoon. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. 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 Bye. Thanks,